one. Hello, everyone. In this video, I am fortunate enough to sit down with the director behind upcoming Christmas film, Violent Night, which releases in theatres on the 2nd of December. That's right, Tommy Workola. You may recognise Tommy as the director behind films such as Dead Snow, What Happened to Monday, Hansel and Gretel, Witch Hunters, The Trip, Kill Bojo, and much more. Tommy, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me, sir. How are you doing today? I am good. Uh, thank you. How are you? I'm great. Like we were talking about off air, we're getting in the festive spirit. You know, normally if anyone watches my interview, they'll notice that my wall has been pushed out that way. That's because my Christmas tree has been put up. And when I told my parents that I was interviewing Tommy Workola and they can't put the Christmas tree there, that didn't really get me much leeway. So now there's a Christmas tree there, but I think it adds to the ambiance. It, it, it sure. leads us into the interview. You know what I'm saying? So if anything, it's a creative decision to have this Christmas tree in the way. I love it. Love it. It's perfect. There, there's no baubles on it, so it's basically just a pine tree sitting in my sitting room, but we'll we'll figure that out. We'll do something in post. Uh, no, Tommy, I mean, first things first, let's talk about Violent Night, your newest film. I mean, what can you tell us all without obviously spoiling the plot? Uh, what can you tell us about the film? Well, I mean, uh, I can definitely say the different type of Christmas movie. That's that's one thing. It's a, it's a very R-rated action Christmas movie. Um, and it stars David Harbour as Santa. Uh, who is a Santa we have not quite seen before. He's kind of disillusioned and he's depressed and and he's kind of fed up with Christmas and humans and feels like we lost kind of track of why we're celebrating Christmas. It's all about consumerism and toys and gadgets and gizmos. So he's actually considering hanging up his boots. Um, but he's out doing his rounds and he comes across his house where this very rich family lives because he's there uh, as a there's all this little girl who's there that still believes in him and is written to him. And he's in the midst of delivering presents when uh, the compound is taken over by terrorists. And normally, because he's kind of like, he, like I said, he doesn't really care that much about humans anymore. He would normally just get out of there. But this little girl, she's super sweet and she really believes in him. And he, he decides to stay and help. Um, so it's basically die hard, but with Santa Claus anyway. Um, wrapped Here. in and around a Christmas movie. I think we've all looked at Santa Claus and said, what if he was depressed and had to fight terrorists? So I think you just took him to his natural wit. I mean, when I think every child has associated him with that, with depression and alcoholism and stuff like that. So I think it was the natural decision to make a film. I'm surprised it took this long. You know, it was yeah. only true, truly only a matter of time. But that said, you know, there's been a lot of horror movies in and around Santa Claus and Christmas. When yeah. I grew up, there was a movie that I watched a lot called... Uh, Silent Night, Deli Night, which kind of my sound here, um, which I was frightened slash I loved when I grew up. Uh, super, but yeah, these the, mostly horror movies, and in those movies, Santa was the bad guy. And he's going to stress, even though he's he's kind of in a dark place when we meet him, he's definitely the good guy in this movie. And yes. he kind of rediscovers his, uh, without spoiling anything, his belief in humans and in Christmas again through this uh, uh, little journey. Dude, it's so fascinating. Yeah, you're right. That has kind of come up a lot, that Santa Claus talking in darker areas. But I can already tell you guys are going to do something fresh and unique with that. I think you can get that from the trailer. And I, I, it's so weird how there's actually two kind of Santa twist films coming out. Joe Bagos also has a new film coming out. So that just shows he's very popular at the moment, it seems, uh, Mr. Claus. Uh, but no, so let me ask you this. When you're working on a project like this, something I've noticed in your work is that, you know, whether it's what happened to Monday, even though it's this sprawling sci-fi film, there's a heart to it and there's an inherent goodness and I mean it's something I think you can even see in the trailer of Violent Night is that this does seem like a very large scale film there are these terrorists that overtake a house but there is that heart that seems to be in the film is that important for you as a filmmaker to to maintain that heart considering that it is still a Christmas film um well for I mean for sure and definitely for this one that was what actually appealed to me when I read the script that I, I knew we could get the action and we could get the humor and the darkness and all that twisted stuff that I love to put in my movies. But what really appealed to me was to, to combine that with the Christmas movie. And to, the goal for me was, despite that you're going to see some crazy stuff in this movie, when you walk out of the theater, you should still feel like you've seen a Christmas movie. You should, you should, you should leave that theater filled with Christmas spirit. That was the goal. So that, that to me, in my head, would make for a very interesting combination to go on that ride, but still have a beating heart of a, of a Christmas movie. 
Yeah. And so did you have to kind of break down Christmas, you know, and really take whittle it down to what it is when you're exploring it in a story sense? Did you have to sit down or because everyone kind of knows what Christmas is? Did you have to, as a filmmaker, look at saying, well, what is Christmas to me and how can I make the best Christmas film? Or did it just come secondhand to you? I mean, it's not something we discuss concrete. I mean, because it's always in the script. And I think what the writers said, and you know, this is one of the films I didn't write myself, even though you know you come on board and you develop the script with the writers, but it was always there. And I think what they said, and what's really true, is that they just all, all Christmas movies are about the same thing, really. Yeah. Like it's about forgetting about the material stuff and the gifts. It's about spending time with the family, spreading joy and spreading love and doing good things. And and it's not about stuff and things and and being good or nice. But like it's 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 grown into something. Yeah, it, it's all about every Christmas movie I've seen. It's all about going back to the basics of being a good person and and spreading love through that. Um, so yeah, to me, I think that was what we discussed and and something we we that was in the script from a very early stage. Yeah, totally. And so, is this your official confirmation that you think Die Hard is a Christmas film? Is this you officially saying it? Knock on wood. Well, yeah. I mean, I always thought it was, but you know, the the writers actually said something funny when they. They wrote, they wrote it kind of like, all right, this is, there's always been this debate about Die Hard being a Christmas movie. Let's just make a Die Hard movie that is 100% a Christmas movie. So, <laughs> Dude, there you go. For that. I got to chat with Andreas Wisniewski, who played the terrorist that John McClane took the shoes off. Uh, you know, halfway through the film, John McClane's on his back, he has the gun, he falls down the stairs. And um, he, I asked him and he said, it can go both ways. So technically no one's wrong, but I mean, I feel like it's a Christmas film as well. So, I mean, me and you have that. So, I mean, there you go. We feel that way. Um, but yeah. no, dude, when you're looking at, you know, as a filmmaker, were there any directing inspirations or any filmmakers you took inspiration from? I mean, looking at the trailer, I think you can see it has that action. It's action, action centric type of feel. Was there any directors you looked at and studied for this film or? I mean, um, obviously because it's, there's, there's no hiding the fact, and you, when you see it, you're, you're, you'll see that too. Like, there's no hiding the fact that we are very inspired by Die Hard and how it's structured. And, and, and uh, yeah, in a way, obviously, the storyline itself. And, uh, but then it's about having fun with that and, 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 and seeing how many surprises we can throw in. But yeah, for sure, McTiernan is a director that I admire. I think he's one of the best directors ever to shoot action. But for me, I, I would also say that two of the biggest inspirations. In all my work, and, and including this one, it's, it's Peter Jackson and Sam Raimi and the, the early stuff that yeah. they've done because they are the ones, that, at least, to, that opened my eyes to, uh, oh, okay, you can actually have be really funny, but at the same time, you're really scary and have it really gory. And I remember seeing that live, um, your brain dead, yeah, and you yeah. do, and like just an eye opener. Like, oh, you can actually do all these things together. Uh, so that's something I always try to do with my stuff. Uh, even in you know, Monday, there's moments where it's super dark, but hopefully super funny. And yeah, uh, and, but certainly in this one, there's there's a lot of that. But so McTiernan for sure, but Raimi and Jackson and all my stuff. And there's also you don't see it much in the trailer, but there's a big tribute to Home Alone as well in the film. That is yeah. one of the best scenes in the film. And so obviously we had to go and study those movies and how they're structured and especially the set pieces. Um, so um, a lot of influences for sure. But um, yeah, those are the big ones, I would say. Dude, that's really fascinating. And I love what you said about John McTiernan. I feel like he's a filmmaker who doesn't get his due. Him and Brian De Palma are just people. I mean, they should be held in a higher regard, especially. I think Brian De Palma is considered more of a household name than John McTiernan. But Peter Jackson and Brain Dead, that's a reference not many people will, will know. But that that's super interesting. And Raimi, I think you can totally see Raimi in, in loads of filmmakers' work. He's just such, he's yeah. done so much. I assume Evil Dead 2, Evil Dead 1, is that the inspiration? Oh yeah, even even that too. I was saying mostly because that was where he really went on, uh, overboard with the comedy as well, and, yeah. and really embraced that. So. Yeah. Is it, is it hard to balance that comedy and action? Because, I mean, you see, even in the trailer, there's these comedy beats. And I think you kind of mastered that. In all your films, there is comedy. And in some, it's more evident. and some, it's more purposeful. In other films, it's more, you know, layered in the back. Is it hard to balance that dichotomy of action, comedy, and heart? The, the triangle? Um, well, I mean, yeah, it's always something you, you discuss a lot and you, you pay attention to. And what is too much and, and where is it when you need a laugh or a joke or where can it be fun to relieve tension and but it's yeah it's it's a balancing act and and, uh, and this film 
for sure there was that we in the edit room we had cut a lot of jokes even though this movie is super funny and does have a lot of jokes we just yeah uh, again like we felt okay ending on a joke on this scene kind of it sets the wrong energy for the next scene and then the, the next laugh doesn't work as well so it's all about okay, how many jokes how many where how dark do you put it like i love to go dark in my action and comedy and and <clears throat> and we, the studio gave us total freedom on this one and really trusted us and but still there was a couple of moments where we even in this film just saw and realized especially when we're cutting it's like you know what this is actually a little too dark i think we've got to pull back a little mm-hmm. bit here even for our film um so yeah you, it's something you're always conscious about and 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 trying to find that sweet middle ground yeah totally and i mean i think when you put it like that yeah it is hard to build and construct a film I and mean, comedy is its own beast completely i've chatted with a few comedy directors and i mean i don't think people are aware of how much work goes into comedy something may not be funny but if you put a pause in there and there's two beats all of a sudden it becomes funny or if you cut to a reaction shot you know these films you really do have to construct them and so let me ask you this. I, I assume you've seen the film. I know I think there's been a few screenings throughout Los Angeles before the film officially releases uh, December 2nd. Well, can you watch this film freshly or is, is it hard for you as a filmmaker? Do you have to watch this and be like, oh, I could have gone for that shot. I could have done this differently. Is it a battle or are you are you happy to sit there and say, you know what, I'm proud of what I did? You know what? I do. Some, I, I love sitting down and watching it with an audience um, because at this point, I mean, there's no hiding the fact that this is a film that should be seen with a lot of people. So you get a yeah. lot of energy from that, and there's a lot of big laughs and big set pieces that people share. And so you want to, because you've seen it like 200 times at this point, you've seen it to death, and you know every every pause or beat or line. Or, so it's really, I actually think it's kind of, first of all, it's just useful for me. I can also see what works and what, oh, here we could have tightened it a little bit here. And now uh, this that joke really didn't land as well as we hoped. But most of all, it's, it's actually also just, re- in their, I would say reward, not rewarding, but it's just, it's a, it's a nice end to the whole process to, to experience with an audience, especially in, in this, this kind of film where it's so, it really, it really plays well with the crowds. So you can really feel the energy. It's, 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 a, it's a really nice feeling. And especially when you see, ah, that works. So this build up, leave that laugh really worked. And, and obviously, you know, because you've seen it so many times, like for me, seeing it in the cinema with the audience, I, yeah. and this one I, I've done a couple of times. I'm going to see it one more time for the premiere and probably one or two after that, just around your Q&A. And then never time. again. Well, then many, then then no, for not for a long time, yes. Uh, but I do think for the process, for the, like, if I look at the entire thing, yes, it's a kind of a nice end to it all. Like everybody, because at that point, the movie's locked. There's no more debate. There's no like yeah. uh, the movie's mixed. And the music is on. Everybody can just enjoy it. Um, so it's it is an I actually do enjoy it. I know some directors and actors that don't like sitting with the crowd, and but I do. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard that from it. It's it's like so split down the middle. I've had some directors say they love watching it with an audience. I've I had some directors say they watched it once, they'll never watch it again. You know, it, it, there's a really interesting uh, contrast I've noticed a lot. But yeah, man, that's really fascinating. And I mean, let me ask you this: Do you hope this film is held in it? Do you hope this film is watched every year? You know, do you hope it's held in a Christmas movie? Regard, is that your goal with this film? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, it was it, it was at least our dream. Like when we discussed it in the beginning and. It felt like, okay, yes, this could, if we do it right, it could be a movie that you watch uh, for years from now. I mean, obviously, after the youngest kids have gone to bed, but uh, yeah. something you can put on in the evening. And, and, and yeah, I mean, because it is, it is, uh, I just know by myself, like for myself, like when I, in, in, during Christmas, there are certain movies that I always watch if they're on. And, uh, and you, you hope that this could be maybe one of them. Yeah. It is. It's hard art, right? I I assume it's the same tr- all over the world. Do you think my cinema will let me in to see it? Do you think if I tell them I'm best friends with the director, I'll get some leeway there? Or yeah, I mean, for sure, for sure. I mean, I, so- this is a movie I would have loved to sneak into when I was younger. I, I would have died to see this kind of film, and I probably would have snuck in or found a way in. Yeah, so I'm sure you can get in. So you're giving me the stamp. I can officially say you're my best friend and give me some leeway in. Yeah, you can just bring this recording with you to the cinema and say. 
Time Lord Cola says it's okay. You can we'll set up a Zoom call and I'll just bring the laptop with me into the cinema, yeah? And then then yes. you can watch that. Who needs a premiere when you can watch it through my Zoom laptop? And maybe they'll arrest me for pirating, but I'm willing to die on that hill. You know what I'm saying? Dude, I, I, no, I'm a master of sneaking in to see films. I mean, funny enough, I saw the trailer for Violent Night when I snuck in to go see Barbarian a second oh. time because I really loved it the first time. So, I mean, seeing the trailer on a big screen and you can totally feel like it's a film that you want to see theatrically. I mean, it just yeah. looks so bombastic and visual. Was that was that like a, a an intentional decision for you? Or do you feel like the best way for this to be viewed is on that IMAX big screen? Well, I mean, the IMAX was, we just heard the other day, it actually is going on IMAX. So that was a nice surprise. Um, but yeah, the Universal have been very clear that they wanted this to be a theatrical. And yeah. and the script, uh, from, even from when I come on board, it was always like a rock and roll script like you can feel that this would play really well with the crowd and we just had a screening last weekend for beyond fest which was like a rock concert it was hollering and cheering and screaming and laughing and and, and uh, yeah for sure like uh, this is a movie that really should be seen with a crowd and, and a late night sh- screening are perfect i think Dude, and let me ask you this. This is a, a, a natural filmmaking, just a, just a fun question. Is there any film that's not conventionally a Christmas film that you feel is a Christmas film? Or is, is it just all the classics that you tend to feel like are Christmas films? No, there's, I mean, like, I actually like, well, yes, they're all the classics, but there, I, I think a lot, I watch a lot of, I love Shane Black. And obviously he puts his films often in Christmas, Iron Man 3, uh, Long Kiss Good Night. I think it's Christmas too, right? And I've actually never that. realized that. That's really interesting. That is, yeah, I, I can actually yeah. see that now that you mentioned that. I think even Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, I think that's Christmas too. I mean, I mean he puts a lot of movies during Christmas. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, the Lethal Weapon 1 or 2 is certainly during Christmas. So yeah, uh, yeah I, 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 I know one of the Lethal movie. Weapons is, yeah. That, that's yeah. really interesting. For me, it's In Bruges. I don't know if you've ever seen In Bruges. but oh, yeah, it's I love it. Oh, dude, it's an amazing film. It snows at the end of that, so that's Christmas enough for me. It gives me an excuse to rewatch it in December. I mean, what more could you possibly ask for? If it snows at the end, it's good enough. Uh, but no, so let me ask you this. You know, uh, what are your future plans? Is there a genre you'd love to tackle that you have yet to as a director? Is there any projects you'd like to return to? I mean, after Violent Night, where do you see yourself going? Um, I, I, That's a good question. I'm not sure. Like, I, I don't have a... Normally, you kind of when you have a film because you're always nervous how it's going to do and maybe it, it'll end your career so you kind of have the next thing we'll try to have it lined up or sort of so that's up. what you're thinking right now just may in my career move on to the next thing no no, no I, I don't have like I, actually this one because i did the trip and led it right into this one so it's been two movies back to back um, and i just taking a moment and reading some stuff and figuring out i'm actually doing we're in production right now but it's like a two and a half years process we are doing an animation movie for grown-ups in Norway nice. um, called Spermageddon. Yeah, and it's, it's it's like Fast and the Furious, but with sperm. So that's what... There you go. That's, that's the tagline. Put that on the poster. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Dude, let me ask you this. Do you feel like you're the filmmaker you are because you're from Norway? Do you feel like if you... Because what's really fascinating to me is I feel we're all products of our environment, whether or not we realize that I grew up in Ireland, that I, I think differently than someone from America. Do you feel like because you're from Norway, it makes you different as a filmmaker? Oh, yeah. I mean, for sure. That's obviously a big... There's, there's always like directors and filmmakers, whatever, whoever you like, you, you always have something in common a lot of times because you've seen the same movies and you're inspired by the same movies and you saw them at a very specific time of your life. But for sure, like I'm from the very northern Norway I, where I grew up. There's like, yeah, what is it, 19th of November today? Like we lose the sun about now and the sun is away until mid-January and it's just darkness and cold. And and so you stay inside, you watch a lot of movies, you read a lot. And uh, like, of course, you're in your shape of environment. And, and, and I have, I, I come from a very, very, tiny place as far north as, you, as north as you can get and i love snow i love winter like for example like just like the obvious examples i, I like shooting movies in snow because yeah. i'm from the, that yeah. that environment yeah. i love putting i love seeing stories set in snow like there's a sequence in this film where originally there was a helicopter thing and like a little bit of an action sequence at the end but i wanted to change it i changed it to snowmobiles because i grew up loving snowmobiles so like there's obvious like clear things it just happens to be from where i grew up and what i love growing up in my movies um but for sure it shapes your your taste and your sensibilities and she has a sense of humor i have a very big group of friends all of which share a very very dark twisted sense of humor and that i can certainly see that in uh in my movies yeah 
Totally, man. And I think that I think that's really amazing. And I love seeing, you know, because I've, I've talked to so much filmmakers who grew up in America. And I mean, not to slight them at all, because getting into film, no matter where you're from, is hard. But, you know, when you see people from Ireland and from Norway and from Scotland and all these different places that aren't necessarily hubs for filmmaking, make it to Los Angeles. So I picture you basically hiking through the snowy mountains in Norway to Los Angeles. And then they just gave you Violet Night. It's as easy as that, I assume. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, yes, it, it, it's not as easy as it, but you know, my my way in uh, to Hollywood was just making my crazy stuff up north. It, I, you know, it was dead snow that got me uh, me- meetings in Hollywood. And and I, I mean, like, I think I, that came out in 2009 in January. And that following spring, I sold on Snow Gretel. And so that was, I mean, it, it was never as fast again and never as easy again. But that was so fast. I did Kill Blue You. I did Dead Snow. Got into Sundance, I got my agent, and then I met with Adam McKay and Will Ferrell, my first meeting the first day here in Hollywood. It's not bad. And they took me to Paramount a couple of days later with my idea of Hansel and Gretel. So there was like a whirlwind in the beginning of my career, which, you know, like uh, was good and bad. Like I made that film, Hansel and Gretel, when I was very young and didn't, I mean, I only made movies with my friends up till then. So it was kind of a big, big uh, change for me. and. Um, but it was also a huge learning curve and experience for me so uh, that I brought on to my new projects and yeah, yeah but it's been a crazy ride for sure dude definitely I mean let me ask you this besides Spermageddon is that what's kind of on your schedule is there any other films the Dead Snow Tree is that something you'd ever think about pursuing um, well I mean yes it was but uh, not to bring to, to set, bring down the mood here but um, Vega Hul was the lead in Dead Snow 1 and 2 and wrote Dead Snow 2 with me and Stig he passed away last year from leukemia Oh so, man, I'm so sorry it, to hear that. Yeah, no, it was thank you. Know, uh, uh, tremendous loss for obviously his family, for us, and for I mean, he was a, a an amazing human human being, but he's also a fantastic writer and, and an actor. Yeah, and a lot of the dead snow is him, you know. So it, we we have talked about maybe doing something in the world of TV if possible, but mo- movie wise, yeah, I don't think there will be another one, not for me at least. Well, I mean, man, you should be amazed. You should be very proud of the work you guys have done. I mean, I think. Dead Snow 1 and Dead Snow 2 are two amazing films. And again, my my true condolences for that. Uh, let me ask you this. Any genres you'd like to tackle? One of my last questions before I let you go. Um, uh, when are we know. getting the musical? When are we getting the Tommy yeah. Workola musical? Well, there's, there are musical numbers in Spermageddon, so that might count as that. So, Dude, uh, so we're just, getting a music. Yeah. Can this be my headline? Tommy Workola talks new musical? <laughs> yeah, go for it, man. Um... um I don't know. Like, I, there's a couple of scripts that I've been working on with my that I, the guys I wrote the trip with that I hope to make. It's, it's and I certainly I would love to make. Uh, as and I feel like all directors say this, but they would love to do a western, and I would also love to do a World War Two movie, which is, we have written a script for that I hope to make someday. Oh, dude, a World War II movie would be fantastic from you. But Western comes up all the time. I'm so surprised. So many people want to do a Western. I think the Western's making a resurgence because you look at the period Westerns were like in the 60s. And I've talked about this in depth with filmmakers. And I know our time's coming now. Uh, but you kind of There's see no it. rush, by the way. But go for it. No, no rush. Oh, no, that's very nice to say. Thank you. Uh, but Western seemed to be immensely popular. And there was a period, right, where you saw John Wayne and they were just pumping out these Westerns. And now I feel like superhero movies have taken on that mold it's it's a really interesting dichotomy to see but yeah western is that something you'd love to pursue yeah yeah and like, like i said i mean i i i grew up it was one of them there's certain genres you always watch with your like i was watching my dad and that was world war ii movies and 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 westerns and yeah i love i still love westerns i, I watch i try to watch them all when they come out and it's a genre that i truly 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 love um so, yeah, hopefully one day. I mean, but they're hard to get made. They are really hard to get made. Yeah, you'd probably have to go and shoot it in, like, New Mexico. There'd be no snow unless you're unless that's your that's your way in, that's your angle, a Western setting completely in snow. It'd be hard bringing horses through snow, yeah. though. And yeah, no, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, I mean, yeah, certainly. I mean, uh, Hateful Eight had a lot of snow, which turned to... Yeah, oh, my days. Days. I'm having an off day. Yes, of course, Hateful Eight did have... Well, you, but, no, I mean, though, if I do a Western, I would... I think yeah, I would love to be shooting in the in the plains uh, up here in the in the in the Grand Canyon. I mean, like that kind of environment that would be huge. But who knows? Those are, and they're really hard to get made because, um, like, the word here is that uh, they don't do that well for them. Uh, like they do well in the U.S., but they're hard to get uh, big numbers on um, overseas. 
So, but and could your know, Norway skin handle the heat? Because my Irish skin can't. When we get a Sunday here, I mean, it's just I, I'm horribly, I guess, sunburned. And so, I mean, I don't know. I think me and you are we're genetically we're genetically disadvantaged, you know. Yeah, I, yeah, I would I have to dress up severely. Uh, no, I, you know what? I I did. I, I I'm not. Um, my son doesn't necessarily love the California sun, which we're on mm -hmm. now. But but I did study film actually in Australia, so I I, I felt like I, that was a good uh, learning period for me of dealing with the sun. Australia is like California, but it has spiders. Like that's so much. Like it has spiders and rattlesnakes and stuff like that. You know. So I mean, there you go. Yeah. That just shows, man. But yeah, dude, there are so many genres. I think I think you you can see in your work. I feel like you could totally tackle all these other elements. Uh, one of my last questions before I let you go: What advice would you have for anyone looking to become a filmmaker? Um, it's one of the hardest questions to answer. I always feel like because it's so. I feel like so many different stories and so many different ways ways in, and I can only speak what worked for me. And like I come from Norway, and I in, in Norway when I came up at least there was a very limited like film industry, and they made a certain type of film, a lot of dramas, not no genre movies basically were getting made. Really? Um, yeah, no. So for me, I and I always kind of I never tried to follow a trend or like think about okay, what would people love or what would people what's in right now and what would people go watch? I always just made stuff that I loved that I wanted to see and that I, me and my friends, when, when, my, my first two films were uh, written by my best friend and he were just like, okay, what do we think is funny? What do we love? What do we want to see? Like, oh yeah, Nazi Sami movie. Let's just, let's make that. Yeah. Um, so I just always, uh, yeah, I just, uh, whatever weird idea we had, we made instead of trying to kind of calculate uh, what people respond to or what people like these days. That's the way to do it, I feel, because if you if you make it like let's we talk about if you make a Western just because Westerns are popular, uh, it makes it it loses almost an element of heart because you can't force something like that. Almost it, you, you can tell if a creator is doing something because they love it or because they think it'll make money. So I think heart like to me, film is about connection. And like I, I can connect with your work. Like I said, that's something I really admire. No matter how big or bombastic it is, there's always a heart to it. And that's always tied into it. But it does make it, you know almost ungenuine when you do something just because you think it's popular or commercially successful so so that's that's a really interesting point but um dude let me ask you this what i i know i sometimes i ask this to a director but if you had to recommend the viewers one film to watch later tonight or tomorrow or later in the week what is a film that you've just been loving right now that you think people should go check out it can be a film from 1942 it can be a film from the 80s it can be a film from last week what's a film you think people should go check out obviously besides violent night which everyone should go check out anyway mm, that's a good question I, I well a movie that you mentioned earlier is something i actually just watched last week which i love was barbarian but it was a great film man it's uh, so good isn't it? it so fun and scary and and yeah just great performances great direction I, I really really enjoyed that one and yesterday i watched the northman which i hadn't seen which i really yeah. enjoyed oh, robert eggers yeah yeah so he's doing Nosferatu, man. man. He's doing Nosferatu. That just shows, yeah. man. That'll be interesting for sure. Oh, I can't wait to see his take on that. But yeah, this I'm I'm so honored that you took the time to chat with me, sir, because this is the first time I've gotten to chat with a filmmaker be before their film has come out. So I feel like an official press person. Does this make me an official journalist? Uh, but no, so. man. I'm so honored you take the time to chat with me. It's such an honor. Before I let you go, is there anything you can promote? Are you on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram? I am on Instagram, but I I, I don't really use it. I don't, I'm not uh, I'm not great with those things. Um, but no, dude, it was my pleasure, and you had uh, great questions. I have to say, it's not uh, because I, I just last weekend I did my um, my press round, like you, where you sit and you do forty interviews a day. Yeah, and it's always the same questions over and over again, which is fine because they all all the different countries uh, just need to promote it. But yeah, you had some good questions, man. I, I really enjoyed talking to you. Man, that's so very nice of you to say, but like, like, yeah, I, I love chatting with filmmakers and just getting nerdy and talking about film. And you're a filmmaker I've admired for so long. And I mean, arguably, you're the busiest you've ever been in your career. And you took the time to chat with some jackass from the middle of Ireland. So it's a it's a true, genuine honor. You're as nice as they come. And just for you, I'm going to give I'm just going to I'm going to give you a gift here. I'm going to let you I'm going to let you see me put on this Christmas hat. Oh, nice. So I love it. Uh, I did. This is basically my way of saying thank you for coming on. So no, thank you, man. It was it was a pleasure, dude. And, uh, uh, thank you so much. Any new projects you can promote or anything people should go check out? Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, why the night? I mean, and I hope you like it. I'm curious to, to see what you think. Dude, I'm so excited. I mean, I have your permission to go sneak in with my friends. So that's basically the plan. Um, I, I, this is my way I sneak in the Simmons. I wear jeans because jeans make me look old. And I, I, can you see I've been growing out my mustache? Does it come across through the camera? No, 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 no. It's okay. I'm really. blonde. But in real life, it's, it's Burt Reynolds style. Like you can really yeah. see the mustache. Uh, but man, listen, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, but yeah, it's been such a true pleasure. Uh, but yeah, all right, everyone. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please make sure to like and subscribe. As always, you can follow me over on Twitter if you'd like, Daniel Fee 33 uh, you Go follow Tommy as well. Tommy's on Twitter. Tommy Workola, is that right? Yeah, Twitter and Instagram. It's just my name. It's, I don't think there's any more Tommy Workolas out there, but maybe, maybe. Dude, maybe there'll be a resurgence of it. But uh, Violet Night comes out December 2nd. I got this little cinema booklet there. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please make sure to like and subscribe. Follow me over on Twitter, Daniel Fee Tree. And as always, if you have the means, please make sure to donate to the National Deaf Children Society. But Tommy, thank you again. You're an absolute legend. Everyone go check out the film, but stay safe. I will see you all later.